we're in a situation where, cut a very long story short, I basically volunteered for the best part of a year and a bit because I could see the opportunity, but I understood that it was going to be difficult. What had to happen was the people I was working with had to make their breakthrough and I had to meet other people along the way who were, if you like, more important than them, who would then be able to financially afford me. Hi, welcome to Black Ticulate, Black Ticulate, a podcast series featuring UK young black professionals where we find out how they do what they do so you can too. Or not. After all, it is your life. <laughs> welcome to another episode of Black Ticulate. For those of you who don't know what Black Ticulate is, I'm a little bit vexed. I ain't gonna lie, where you been? Popping off, aren't we, Wills? Oh, most definitely. We're getting there. We're getting there. Most definitely. For those of you who've just stumbled upon this, this is all about featuring young UK black professionals, where we try to find out exactly how they do what they do, so you can too. So we look at resources, tools, tips, frameworks, you know, things that are just helping them in their daily professional lives. And I'm going to put a caveat on this one, a disclaimer. Speaking to one of my boys here, so it might get a little bit dumb. But if it gets dumb, it's not my fault because he's just that guy. He really is just that guy. So, uh, <laughs> Martin uh, Wilson. Uh, yeah, that's the so name. <laughs> please tell my bosses, my listeners, who you are, what you do, and then, you know, we just roll from there. Okay, cool. I am Martin Wilson, as you said. I am a consultant osteopath who works in sport mainly. So, different areas of sport, from athletics to boxing football rugby american football and baseball let's start from scratch okay your background like let's mm. talk about upbringing because oh, okay. it's not necessarily a typical path with all due respect osteopath like, no 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 what we, is an osteopath let's let's define that yes yeah, I, I was gonna say a lot of people will probably be going osteo what Oste, yeah. Oste, he Oste, and they'll go oh is that bones and then i'll sort of go well, not really because i can't do anything to, to bones that's that's GBH, if you, <laughs> 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 um, if, if you if you start doing stuff like that. But um, uh, <laughs> um, no, to us, um, yeah. So an osteopath. Um, how to explain an osteopath without offending all my other medical peers and not downplaying what it is that we do? But it's uh, it's a manual therapy, so it's similar similar to a chiropractor or a physiotherapist. Uh, I would argue that our diagnostic training is more extensive and longer. We actually are considered primary healthcare, so you can kind of walk off the street into an osteopath as your first port of call. Primary healthcare? Yeah, primary healthcare. Because you have primary healthcare, secondary healthcare, and tertiary healthcare. Okay. So it's primary healthcare is like the first person you meet, like your GP, people who you go to to start with. Right. People who are referred on to from there is normally secondary, secondary healthcare. Right. And then the people who you kind of see as a result of having seen that second person and they're dealt with, then it's tertiary healthcare. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So it's just, it's just the kind of the ways you get there, if you gotcha. like. So an osteopath is a primary health care well, yeah, well, Technically speaking, we are, we walk are up the street. Yeah, you should go there first. Yeah. Obviously not for anything. <laughs> if you've got like some seeping wound coming from your head, you, you, don't, you don't fly to your osteopath. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if I was to distill what you're saying is you predominantly would go to an osteopath, someone like yourself, yeah. is if you were suffering from some form of, I wouldn't say bone per se, but Muscus, like... Musculoskeletal. So it's musculoskeletal is the, is the basis of what we do. It's not all we do, but musculoskeletal. So anything from your toe to the top of your head that involves muscles, joints, ligaments, you probably go to see an osteopath. Uh, yeah, so musculoskeletal is, is, is what is our bread and butter. Having said that, I will say to everyone, go see an osteopath if you get the chance. If you have a problem, any issues, go see one because you'll have a different view on how things work and it is important. And a lot of people don't know about osteopathy and, and then they think it's for this or that. But I think a, a lot of people could do with osteopathic treatment if they if they need it. And they're quite expensive, no? It depends, like anything. You know, how good that person is, how busy that person is, how well-known that person is. Yeah. Um, but you, you can go down to the British School of Osteopathy in Borough and go to one of their tutor-led clinics. And that is, as far as I'm concerned, pretty cheap because you're getting treated by sort of last year students with the supervision of a tutor and they're pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you want to try it for a reasonable price, that's where you go. I, mean, I used to treat people there and people, it's not like people don't get better. People go there and they get the results they want. So it's a, it's a good idea. Are we done? <laughs> yeah, that's about it that's it hey listen 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 the way I'm trying to educate yeah. do you know what I mean no, 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 I'm, trying to, I'm it. trying to educate no I think you've given us a really good definition and also a good advocate for the, for the profession in of itself you don't get many 
black. Osteopaths, yeah. So how? Like, how is that even an option? How did you know about osteopaths? Um, I mean, like... It was, yeah, so I guess... Join those dots for us. I was young and I was basically raised by seven osteopaths as a small child. This guy is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but yeah, no, um, I guess for me, so my upbringing, my background, um, I was fortunate enough to, to go to a nice grammar school in Kent called Cranbrook School. Right, okay. Boarding school, actually. And well, as you know... Um, and uh, we're starting there, yeah. Well, that's that's probably if you want to know how we became an osteopath, that's kind of where it starts for me. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I grew up in London. I was born in Britain, born in Tottenham, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then my mum being of Nigerian parents, so that's where I'm at. Um, so you already know that basically I wasn't gonna get uh, <laughs> anything less than a hundred percent pressure about my education. So uh, my mum used to travel a fair bit, and um, so she felt it'd be better if I was in a more stable environment in a boarding school. So, yeah. and if I went to Kent, yeah, basically, obviously, black kid, I think one of three, four, maybe in the whole school. Whole you know, school. Yeah, in the whole school. So, you What's know. What's the school name drop? Uh, Cranbrook, Cranbrook School. Hopefully the, uh, Cranbrook school the, the portfolio is a little bit more diverse. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I, 100%, 100%. Oh, yeah, I could tell you some stories. It's funny <laughs> when I actually did a, a little uh, tour for some parents. No, they got me to do the tour for Ofsted. Right. Which... I was old enough to understand why I was being picked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah, yeah. That was one of those funny moments where you're like, oh, that's weird because I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, I'm a decent student, but you know, you know, <laughs> this is a high risk maneuver. Do you know what I mean? You know what I'm like. Do you know what I mean? So it's a high risk maneuver. Then I was like, oh, I see. Of course. Yeah. Look what we've done to this young black child. Look, look, you see, and he's here and he's prospering and, and he speaks he so well. Out. Do you know what I mean? And, and look, so, you know, he's just like everybody else. He's practically one of us. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, you got to you laugh it off, don't you, uh, at the time. Uh, but yeah, so that was it. So obviously I did the thing for us and he was so impressed. Like they started getting me to do tours for like all these parents until one day I decided to turn up with, uh, I had like King Road and stuff at the time. And I just looked, took my hair out. I turned up like with an afro, having just played sport. And I think that was the end of my my yeah. my tours because I looked like a mad person. And I was like, "Hey guys, like some sort of sideshow Bob. Like, let's go see the school." <laughs> see what I mean? But anyway, I digress. But yeah, basically through there, um, uh, one of my friends, his father was an osteopath, right? And I always knew that I basically wanted to do something which involved working with people. I like a challenge, and people are the greatest challenge out there in my opinion because they're forever changing no one's no one's ever the same yeah so i knew i wanted to work with people and i enjoyed working with people i felt you know that was something like it's kind of giving back i like caring about that sort of thing and then um i wanted to work in something scientific so it was the chemistry biology that was where i was at was that what you're excelling at at school yeah so those are those are my things uh so it was chemistry biology and um i think for me i you know i, I remember a teacher of mine saying to me you know man you could study medicine because it's hard and i don't know if you've got the discipline for it he says he's not wow. and he, he was obviously, and I actually like him you know shout out to Mr Turner he's a, he's a still in touch with him actually recently when I was trying to or I still am trying to develop something and I, I went and had a little talk with him about the chemistry side of stuff but he was honest with me and it was he he you know he's like you're not it's not that you know I've got the brains for it discipline wise I'm not sure if that's really what you want to you really want to be at or where you want to go so and I think he sort of did me a favor in a weird way because really and truly when I met my friend's dad and he he was an osteopath and I was like what is that what's that about this is what he does and I just basically understood that he was his own boss, he worked with people, he could make change and there was challenge to it. Right. And I just was like, that sounds right up my street and it combines biology and it combines learning and I was like, this is this is good, this is good. Uh, and it's, you know, it's four years instead of seven. Um, so I was like, this is, this could be it, this could work for me and I need, me personally knowing myself, I needed to be something when I finished. Right. I couldn't have a degree in say history or French or English or something like that because that would require me to take it and then make it into something else. And I know what I'm like. I'm like. I need to be on a track. Really singular. Yeah. So, so I knew that I'd leave and that's what I have to do. Okay. I, I actually get that. And from Cranbrook, mm. you went on to university yeah. to study this specific yeah. degree. I mean, is is it a specific degree? Yeah, or, yeah. So what's it called? What's the degree? Well, it used to be a Bachelor's of Science, but they decided to make it their own thing and call it a Bachelor, bachelor of Osteopathy. So you can okay. be OST. You want just to basically be a bit more quirky and cliquey, I guess. I don't know, just to make it seem like its own thing. And in regards to subject matters that you must know, so you said sciences. Yeah, I mean, you're going you're gonna to need the sciences because the first year is just basically all anatomy. So you're going to have to have a good knowledge of biology, biology sciences, maths, anything after that. 
you know, okay. you, you could you could be it could be something like English or history because you're gonna have to do quite a bit of writing as well. So it doesn't really matter as long as you have an interest in the scientific aspect of it. I think you'll. Because I mean, as you can see my angle, I'm just trying to figure out the route in. The I get it. In, so. As I said, it's, if you have an interest, that if you don't have an interest in those things, there is an aspect of having like kind of like a summer school where they kind of give you a foundation aspect to anatomy and the rest of it. So you can, there are, you know, it's not just straightforward. You have to have these things, otherwise you're not getting in. There is a way. And you must be qualified in order to be an osteopath or can yeah. you just go to your friends and just crack back? No, so no, you, 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 you leave it. You leave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I've got time for you now. Yeah. Word of mouth. Yeah, you want to go to, hey, listen, you wanna go listen, to Martin. Just, it's just cool, write it? Bios at the end of your name. You'll be laughing. Um, yeah, you're qualified. So you finish your four years, you have your degree, then you join the governing body to be called an osteopath. You have right. to join the GEOS, the General Osteopathic Council. To be a, an actual osteopath, you can't just kind of go. I studied. I'm an osteopath. You, can't you, be you right. have to. Right. You have to have something called um, CPD, which is continual personal development. Thank you. Yeah. So um, you you have to have that, which then allows you to continue to practice over and over okay. again. I know you personally, obviously, yeah, yeah. and I think I've put a disclaimer out there, guys. I do know Martin very well. It has not, not that been well. an easy. <laughs> 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 It hasn't been easy. No, not at all. Your journey hasn't been easy. And it's really inspiring, actually. That's kind so of so. I, w- I want to give you, I mean, this is an open mind, it's a conversation, but where would you, where do you want to take it? Because you had to repeat one of the years because of personal issues. I did indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to speak about that? Oh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I mean, look, it's, I'm here. I'm here with the man himself, Mr. Black Ticulate. So <laughs> we know why we're here. Do you know what I mean? It's to, for people who look like me, what are your hurdles? What are the situations you may face? What are the things you may have to overcome? Understand that osteopathy is a great thing to be part of, but it's extremely, extremely white. Do you know what I mean? It's right. extremely rooted in that. Um, so you will have to deal with that classic kind of lack of understanding and, and to some of the things that you may seem simple enough for you to understand, but for some reason you're you're singled out for certain things at certain times, which you feel like I don't understand what the problem is. You know, I, I'd i watch as some of my colleagues, and you know, I'm not going to mention any names, but some of my colleagues, for instance, things got a bit tough, out come a few tears, they're allowed to take their time or retake a situation or give them five minutes to recuperate. Whereas you're sitting there trying to do your best and you're seen as difficult or, or challenged. I mean, I'll give you an actual real life example. So something you can actually understand that's a, you know straight to the point rather than me just airing my feelings <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um uh, we had this exam so the, the, you get two final exams basically real life situations in terms of you have a patient and you, you not see a mannequin and the actual an patient. actual patient and they okay. examine they, the examiners look at how you deal with a patient basically right gotcha uh, so you have two of those and anyway some of the feedback i got amongst other things was that i looked aggressive oh wow so i was confused because generally speaking if you spoke to most of my patients the last thing they would say is that I was aggressive. They'd say, you know, he's fun, he's uh, relaxing, uh, he has calming, you know, he's jovial. Like, do you know what I mean? I, yeah. And I make people feel at ease. I generally... Yeah, you're very comedic. Um, almost well, like a clown. It's kind of you know, to say. Um, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Let's, Let's not derail that. Hey, listen, podcast. it's fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You know, all I need is a stage. Um, I remember thinking to myself, I don't understand what, what was meant by I was aggressive. And, you know, you're trying to get, you're trying to understand some of the feedback because some of these examiners were our tutors. Mm. So it was very much like, I don't understand what, what was it about me that was aggressive. And it was just, oh, the way you sit. And I was like, oh, yeah, must be. The way I sit with... Uh, you sit. And honestly, the funny thing is, you could be aggressive if I sat in an aggressive manner. But when you're holding a, a effectively what's a clipboard, a pen, and you've got someone facing you and you're facing them and you're asking questions and you're making sure that these questions because some of these are personal questions you're making sure that you're trying to make sure that they don't feel sensitive about these things you really can't look aggressive not right. unless you really dislike what you're doing you yeah. see what i mean but yeah but that's how it came across apparently i'm aggressive so you, you start to realize these things and you start to understand that it's a bit of a club sometimes you know you're not because you know being black and some of the things that people find interesting or funny you don't because culturally speaking you're like that's not really that funny to me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the times I would take myself away to see my friends in London or whatever. And I didn't realize that was perceived apparently as me not wanting to get on with people and, and the rest of it, which I found funny because other people did the same thing. But for some reason, when it was me, mm. it was taken personally. I'm used to it and I can manage it. And, and that's one of those things. But 
in in that scenario, it's difficult because these guys hold the keys to your future. Yeah. And then what I realized is that, and I'm not joking, and I really mean this, when I basically played the game, and not played the game in certain, in terms of, you know, you just made everyone feel nice. You know what I mean? What I mean is that you've played the game of basically making other people feel important and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, I'm staying for that conversation and I'm laughing with this this joke I hate and I'm doing all these things and making everyone feel like, oh yeah, guys, I'm part of you guys. I'm part of you guys. The joke of the matter is everything was 10 times easier. Right. My marks would increase and I'm not even playing. I would study, I'd, I could study less and get a better mark than if I studied more and was just going to university to work and study. So if you're more, quote unquote, culturally accepted, yeah. things would just so much things, easier. Things would be easier. Things would be better. My grades would be better. My life in university would be fun. You didn't, you didn't have the best of times at BSO? Um, I, I had some good times and just, yeah, sometimes, yeah, I, 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 didn't, I wouldn't turn around and tell you it was, the, it was the most fun. But either way, you persevered and you got your degree. Yeah, I persevered. And like, like you said, you know, the personal aspects where I had uh, issues at home. Um, to be frank, it's basically I was homeless uh, because of uh, an issue with my own parents and, and the family house being lost and the rest of it. And again, that's a cultural thing. You know, being the way I am, I wouldn't really want to run to my university and be like, hey, guys, this is what's happened. Do you see what I mean? I didn't, I didn't think that was what I do. It's not what I do. It's, not, it's yeah. not the way I've been raised. But I realize that to them, that's a thing where they expect that's just normal. Do you know what I mean? People could just air really important things. Bring their personal stuff to school. So I started having to, to do difficult things by basically putting my personal life out there with people who effectively are strangers to me. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So uh, that was difficult. But obviously, and I, I'll, I'll argue that that did make things a little bit better for me because it puts things in place. People understand your situation. They can do something about it. So I guess for black people in general, I know sometimes we want to keep stuff to ourselves. But sometimes if you try to take it all on by yourself, then you can't expect people to help you if they don't know what the problem is. They, yeah, that's exactly it. That we, we are culturally taught to be strong. Yeah. And, but, and, and not to speak about your, your personal business too much, yeah. but not to people you don't know. In my household, I blame my dad for that one, <laughs> where he used to know, but like, for instance, you know, someone called, called a phone and asked for Mr. Wilson. I'm there having to make up all sorts of stuff on the spot because I don't know if I'm supposed to give him given the phone, information. Yeah. I'm not who I'm so, I, so as a kid, I'll never forget my dad, <laughs> my dad literally, <laughs> someone goes, oh, can I speak to Mr. Wilson? I was like, he's not in. And then my, and then, um, I said, okay, fine. And then they call back. And he said, and he said, um, yeah, your son said you weren't in. And then obviously from that, my dad was like, yeah, you're a stupid boy. Can you imagine you're giving it all? Da, 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 da. I got all of that. So I was, I was like, I don't understand what I've done wrong. I really don't. I just don't what I've done wrong. But then I started to learn. So that's for me, I guess, growing up was a thing. You yeah. don't give out information like that. It was personal as personal. People only need to know what they need to know. Do you see what I mean? Apart from your close friends and family. I would definitely say to all black people, if you're having troubles, it's better to open up and get some help. And even if you are annoyed by some people knowing the rest of it, it's still a better situation yeah. than trying to do it all on your own. Do you know what I mean? And getting mad that you're not getting the recognition or getting the, the help or the leeway that you feel like you should have given the scenario you're in, you know? No, I get I get that. So let's uh, let's bring this back into the profession. You've now graduated. Yeah. You're not immediately an osteopath, even though you've applied to be part of the governing body and obviously CPD. Mm-hmm. What were you first doing the moment you graduated? When, when you graduate, you know, when you, so when you graduate, I, I applied and you pretty much are an osteopath straight away. You can practice straight away. But I had no capital, so I couldn't set up a practice anywhere. As I said, like, you know, I mean, lost a family house. I was literally trying to rebuild from the bottom up. Do you know what I mean? So I just didn't have the ability to start the business the way I wanted it. Right. So in the meantime, I just started doing other things just for income's sake. And for stability's sake. You said something about starting a business the way you wanted to. Does yeah. everyone go as a freelance and work for themselves? Or? Depends. So some people will work for another osteopath. You right, can yeah. easily work for another osteopath um, and they'll take a cut of any patients you see. Right, gotcha. see what I mean? But for me, I think the way I wanted to do it, I it was the kind of thing I wanted to start my own practice and, and be independent from the get-go. Plus, And also the person that you sort of told you about the route that's exactly what that's what interested yeah. me you see what i mean yeah, that's he was his exactly own exactly that's what interested me so that's what i wanted i didn't really want to to start working for anybody at uh immediately and, uh, given the experience i had at the bso i didn't really feel like you know if you've had a tutor and someone who's effectively been your boss and you haven't had a great experience in that manner wasn't 
the first thing I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. So I uh, so I didn't. I just started working other jobs and and you know they didn't tell you that about osteopathy that basically when you leave nobody knows who you are because you, you you hyped when you <laughs> when you when you qualify you're hyped yeah. you're like listen I'm gonna change the game <laughs> I'm sitting there like listen don't worry about me don't worry about me the next thing you know they're gonna change this whole thing to martinopathy trust me <laughs> when I'm done with this whole situation do you know what I mean this listen guy's, yes <laughs> that, that that was this that guy. was that was how uh, that's how you feel. Do you know what I mean when you get out there, everyone's like, "Who?" Do you yeah, know what I yeah. mean? And you, everyone's like, "I don't know, I don't, I don't know I you." Don't Sorry, know. I don't, I don't give a damn what you, how good you think you are, because word of mouth is literally how you really make your way in this industry. Mm. People have to re- have to recommend you. Mm. So you're building up your capital. So I was building up my capital, trying to get that going. By building my capital, please don't want to start like I didn't want to come like, "Yeah, hundred grand, I'm, I'm in." It was just the ability to take loss because your first few months are going to be pretty much lost months. You don't have the patient list. So therefore, you're going to be paying rent, having consumables, things coming out, but the money that you're generating probably won't be enough to start with. Let's dissect that a little bit. So in terms of overhead or the capital you initially need mm-hmm. post-graduating is you need to be able to pay for office space? For a clinic space. A clinic space, yeah. right? Local to you or a reputable place? Or Just depending matter. on what you want to do, but yeah, yeah. Somewhere, somewhere that people can get to. Anything else you need? Just just to be able to afford the things that you need, the equipment that you need. So what equipment? You're going to need storage, you're going to need a table, you're going to need power, you're going to need... Any table or a specific? A treatment table, okay. what I mean. So a treatment table. Um, You can have a portable one if you want to start out. If you want to have the real professional look, you can get one that's going to stay there oh, and, and has all the... All the bells, yeah, all it, the bells yeah. and whistles on it. So, like I said, you're gonna have that, and then all your consumables, stuff that you use day in day out. So that's your creams, your papers, and the rest of it. Uh, possibly Wi-Fi, depending if you use a electronic system and all these other things. But you might just start with a with a paper system. And I know it's a bit maybe childish to ask, but roughly, what would you say the average cost? To start it depends. It yeah. depends. I'm not, I'm not going to give a number because it's what you're asking because for. What happens is people might then go, actually, I don't have that, so they want. No, 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 no. It, it, it's it's as simple as this. Do your research, look for places that will work for you because it's to say an average number is, is it depends on how ambitious you are, how uh, how crazy you want to be with it. You know, there's people who I know who, who tried to set up in central London, for instance, um, paying a crazy rent. But the fact is, if they had a few patients who were paying a lot more money, they can afford it. Do you see what I mean? So it's just about what you can afford right, yeah. to make it so. Because, I mean, the, the angle of it is I tend to look at the typical route in, right, the education and resources yeah, yeah. needed as well as equipment and, you know, things that could help further learn and always improve. Yeah. Especially if you're already in this profession where someone might be listening to you and going, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's why I, that was my answer. No, no, I, I understand. I think the thing is, that I got the question I guess I can ask you is that it depends on what you're asking for. Because you're asking me now how to set up a private practice, that's one question. If you ask me how to get into sport, that's a completely different thing. Yeah, well, I want to know how you got into the sport. Yeah, right? that's, that, that's the yeah. thing. So, the, But the, I was just the, curious the because you're talking about capital in order for you to set up properly. Yeah. But so for me, my brain, because there's a conversation, Martin, right? <laughs> so I'm like, all, all of a sudden, if I'm listening, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what do I need? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And no, that's yeah. why for me, I guess I d- it almost looked like I went off the path. No, no, no. I was like, oh, what do you need for that? But let's go back into it because we're getting into the GC. The nitty well, then, then, then sport comes because I uh, used to love playing sports, still, still love sport in general. What then happened was... Um, and I had friends of mine who were trying to get me to get into sport. Osteopath friends. Yes, yes. Uh, and so therefore, it was like one of those things where they were like, you know, you should, you should, you should. I know you'll like it. I said, look, give me a year or so because I need to set myself up that I'm not basically just struggling straight away right. when I start to do it. So basically spoke to a friend of mine who had a coach who was in need of a therapist. and a sports coach. Yeah, track and field. And um, he said, look, you guys could be a perfect fit. He's only down the road up in Lee Valley. So we met. And let's, And the, the thing is, they don't know me. No matter how good I think I am, they don't know me. So they're not going to start forking out money because you say you want money. Plus, I want the opportunity. So you, you're in a situation where, cut a very long story short, I basically volunteered for the best part of a year and a bit. Wow. Because I could see the opportunity, but I um, understood that it was going to be difficult. What had to happen was the people I was working with had to make their breakthrough and I had to meet other people along the way who were, if you like, more important than them, who would then be able to financially afford me. Do you see what I mean? And, right, and gotcha. the, so, like I said to anyone, if you're going to get into football, which is even more closed off, into rugby, all these other things, be prepared to volunteer for a bit. I'm not saying you um, do it forever, but if you really want it, you're going to have to volunteer. 
to start with because nobody it's a, it's a very 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 difficult thing in terms of people need to know who you are you need to come recommended if you don't come recommended nobody's really interested in trying you out because just how this is how they are they're all very careful cautious and a bit superstitious sports people so they're not going to do it but you fortunately had someone who worked in sports but also had an opportunity where a sports coach was looking for a fair piss yeah so so th- so that's that's how it began and the challenges i faced there were, were different I mean, one, the beauty of it is like that you're working in track and field, there's a lot of black people. So there's an understanding that I may, or challenges that I may normally have to deal with, I didn't have to deal with anymore because there was an ease of understanding between all of us. Do you see what I mean? Personalities, cultures. I mean, the kids, most of the kids I was working with were Nigerian or African backgrounds. So you get certain things. There's understandings that don't have to be explained. And, mm. and, and, you know, and it was easy in that sense to build rapport with people. So it's that kind of thing. But the fa- challenges I faced were egos from other therapists people working in british athletics who didn't know who i was but i was getting popular so they wanted to know who i was and i had people who were funded trying to work with me so you suddenly face people who then go uh, you're a threat to me and then it begins do you see what i mean then it begins the they 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 want to get rid of you and they will attack you and they will because they're people are fiercely protective over their jobs in these institutions mm-hmm. any sport fiercely protective so they will try to attack you and get rid of you or discredit you or whatever but you just have to remain calm and keep doing what you're doing and the opportunity will present itself so that's what i did i kept working this is the funny part through the guys who were working for british athletics who didn't want me there through their constant complaining and constant attempts to get rid of me my name made it all the way up to the chief medical officer and then the chief medical officer was like what's going on because these guys keep complaining about you and I'd met him once at a competition and we had a little chat. Did you know who he was at the time? Kind of. I knew you know, I knew he was important and that was it. But anyway, cut a long story short, he, he said, look, do me a favour. With the guys that are funded for us, just report into me for the next four weeks, please. I'd appreciate it because I know you don't have to do it. Obviously, this for me was an opportunity. So I did. I reported into him for the next four weeks. He saw that I wasn't doing anything abnormal. There wasn't a problem. He then was like, why don't you come up to Loughborough where they're based and Loughborough is where the Great British yeah that's where the, that's where the high performance centre for athletics is based like, why don't you come to Loughborough and we'll trial you out with some guys and he put me with some of the pretty much the best spring group in the country at the time you had like Adam Jamili, James Asalu um, Asher Phillip and he basically said you know work with them I worked with them everybody was happy coached athletes everyone was happy and he was surprised that actually that they let me work with them. The athletes themselves had actually all let me treat all of them in the way that I, I did. And before I knew it, then he was literally like, do you want to come up again? All this time, he's, he's telling me, I can't promise you that there'll be a job at the end of all of this. But if you keep doing what you're doing, then we'll see. Right. And I just saw the opportunity and I said, I'm going to continue going on this. And they were paying me for this, by the way. This they, point, were. they were. Okay. Once, yeah, once by now, they started to pay me. Right, gotcha. But it was very much like, we can pay you, but we can let you go tomorrow. Yeah. And you have to understand, at this point, I'm giving up a lot of my clinic to do this because I'm going up to Loughborough from London. When I'm doing that, I can't be at my clinic. So again, it was about the opportunity. I saw what I wanted. I made a beeline for it and I was going to do it. And in the space of about four months, I went from an outsider to working with the best group of the country to then making the first major championships with the European champs, I think it was, and making a medical team for that and working with the guys then. Even though I may have spent a year volunteering, Going from a nobody to within four months, yeah. Do you see how quickly it can move? So I always say there's some, there's a lesson in that. There is a there's a massive lesson in that. I think um, trust your timing is better. Capitalize on when the opportunity comes. Exactly. You know, in terms of how things progressed on there, I was, I I'm not like, surprised that I was basically making a lot of headway because, like I said, culturally, a lot of these guys are black athletes wise, so there was an easy understanding. A lot of these therapists who I was working with were white. Do you right. see what I mean? Also, I was relatively young. You know, I was, some athletes were older than me, in fact. So even the non-black African backgrounded or Caribbean backgrounded kids still felt a connection with me because I was relevant. I understand what they were talking about, mm. the jokes, all that kind of stuff. And it was one of those things where because I was like that, people had an innate trust in me. But at the same time, I was also getting them the results therapy wise. Yeah. So I was able to kind of excel, which annoyed a lot of people very much annoyed a lot of lots of people yeah. and then what i expected to happen started to happen there was another guy there who's also black called um james davies so the two of us 
not by force, and I don't, and that's what annoys me, not by force. But obviously, I've known him. He went to, we went to the same university together, by the right. way. So he was an okay. osteopath as well. But we hung out a lot more, and we started to find ourselves forced into hanging out more and more because it suddenly became a bit of an us and them thing, right? Which is a shame. And that's this is over the period of three years to the point where we were at Rio Olympics, for instance, and I'm getting told by the chief medical officer not to hang around with James and him not to hang around with me. That you guys because. Need, I guess because it makes other people feel a certain way. And I sat there thinking, but do you not understand why we do this? We don't have anyone else we can trust because we've been made into an enemy, not because of anything we're doing, just because effectively of how well we're doing. Yeah. Um, people don't give us the respect we deserve, which I know as far as I'm concerned comes from the fact that as far as they're concerned, we shouldn't be where we are. It's almost as if you should be grateful. Exactly. Rather than proud and rather than strong in our positions but then over the next three years I've got to travel the world I mean the job is itself is is great for that work with with incredible human beings doing incredible things in the space of three years I went to loads of Europe the Caribbean America Africa Asia I went all over the shop and I did it I'd learned a lot and I enjoyed it a lot but by the time I got to Rio, it was very toxic by this point. Rio was when again? Uh, 2016. 2016. So that was just, just about a year and a bit ago. Yeah. So it got very toxic by this point. It was a lot of politics, a lot of infighting. Whether people like it or not, there is a racial issue in amongst it. It's very much one of those things where 60% or 70% of the athletes are black, but it seems that 90% of the support staff and coaches are white. Yeah. And you start to ask yourself that question of why that is. And I think there's a problem there. There's a big, big problem there. Uh, and it allows for that institutionalized issues of race to come up and become an issue within within itself. It's and that's, gonna, I was going to say, it's going to be flippant to us because I know there's not one singular answer, but what are the solutions to that? That is a problem. And that's something I, 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 the solution I came up with was to leave and do it myself. And that's the problem because it's an institutionalized issue. Do you mm-hmm. see what I mean? Yeah. That won't be overcome overnight, for do you, sure. Do you, exactly. I mean, we are getting more black people in positions of power, but it's it's slow and it's difficult. You look at the coaches, uh, even in, in, in British athletics and, and athletics in general, you had, at one point, three or four of them were employed. And now it's just down to one. And the joke of the matter is, one person is getting treated one way. And it, it definitely is one rule for one, one rule for another. You know, me, me and James would get scolded and, and um, reprimanded for tiny little things you know James made a joke once about one of his colleagues wearing uh, trousers too high and was given a, a written warning for it but whereas other therapists have done a lot worse and it's known and I'm not going to say it here but it's known a lot lot worse stuff that in any organization you get sacked for but are still there and in fact uh, some of them receive promotions from it and it, right. it, you, so right, you, right, you, right. you sit there going you sit there going, how, how is it acceptable for one and the other? And it doesn't make any sense. So your one of your solutions was to create your own platform and yeah, yeah. Own, bring, hopefully, those from similar backgrounds who are also capable of doing a good job yeah. into the fold. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So I'm with you. Um, I'm just very acutely aware of time. We barely have any other professions than entrepreneurs and creative and media industry. It's nice to have someone who's in the medical field, who's an osteopath specifically, teaching and sharing, you know, his journey and how we can do something similar. So if there's any more questions, we're definitely going to get him on round twos. Yeah. I guess the floor is yours. Is there anything that you think that we haven't discussed if they're trying to get into the industry? What's the best piece of advice, basically? Okay. Um, give. so the I mean, path given some gems yeah I hope so but the path is is there um, to work in elite sport if that's what you wish to do it is difficult it does require a desire to do it it's not something you can kind of fall into especially if you're a person of colour I'll be honest with you having said that I think things to remember would be get your degree don't panic once you've got your degree uh, if things aren't working out the way they're supposed to these things sometimes take time be prepared to volunteer for a period of time and and however that may be whether you have to work two or three jobs for that but also understand that working for an organization and all these other things it's it's great for your cv and great for your growth but the one thing to always remember whilst i say all these things is to remember to know your worth probably more than anything one thing i've i could say that i know i've been guilty of over the last eight years is undervaluing myself sometimes it's a bit of a symptom of black people in general i think we sometimes feel 
that we shouldn't rock the boat because we should just feel grateful for being where we are. But I think if we know our worth, you'll always be given what you're supposed to be given and never fear asking for what you deserve. Do you see what I mean? So that, that will help you to continue to, to rise to where you want to be. And it won't, it will, it's the quickest way to where you want to be. When you hesitate, you're stalling your own progress. Message! No, I um, appreciate that, Martin. And are there any resources that we haven't spoken about? Any, any websites, any like trade magazines or publications or things? That for, for osteopaths? Or I mean, I, there's, you can go, if, you, if you're ever interested in getting osteopathy therapy or treatment, you go on the General Osteopathic Council website. Everything is there. Uh, and, and that will literally take you to wherever you need to go. Or the British, British School of Osteopathy website. If you're looking to study, again, you've got the British School of Osteopathy, the European School of Osteopathy, the London School of Osteopathy, the British Medical School of Osteopathy as well. And just do your research, find out these things. It's hopefully, you know, as I said, um, the council will start to do will do a better job of promoting osteopathy around the world and in this country as well. But for now, it's up to everyone just to kind of look at these things. But the best place to start is with the council. Gotcha. And it's worthwhile. Yeah. Would you say it's worthwhile? What, the, the profession? Or? Yeah, the profession. Uh, absolutely. Abso- yeah. Absolutely. I've loved, I despite all the things I've told you, I love every day because I've literally, as I said to you, got to travel the world, work with amazing people. And even in my clinic, as people tell you, I love my patients and I love working with them and just seeing progress and changing their lives. People come in who can barely walk and are grateful for the fact that they can now do the things that they want and have a better quality of life. That, that for me, is important. So I do enjoy that. And the money? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I'll, be, I'll be frank about the money. The earning potential is limitless. And that's the best way to put it because I'm fortunate to be in a position as we speak, hopefully, to, to be negotiating to work with some American sports and I will literally be earning more, more money than... I would probably earn in any other thing, any other avenue of work that I would have gone into. On a standard situation, you you can make it all, it all depends on how hard you want to work. You can make good money. In a normal clinic, charging fifty, forty pounds, fifty pounds an hour. If you want to work your ass off and you, you're getting them in half an hour, you can still make good money. You can make fifty, sixty, seventy K a year. If you're lucky enough to have more high profile clients, you can make hundreds, a hundred grand, hundred and twenty grand. You know I mean, if you get into elite sport and get higher profile clients, then you can imagine how much money you can make. So Amazing. Okay, sir. So are you ready for a quick fire round? Always, quick man. Questions. Never really been in one for quick fire, but you know. <laughs> no, just... So try and make your answers quick, though, and short. Sure. You know what I mean? I ain't trying to play around out here. Okay. So, you ready? Yeah. If you could do a TED Talk, other than the profession that you're in, what would it be about? Um, Social justice, social change. Social justice, social, social change. Social change, and yeah, 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 yeah. And um, your last five pounds, what are you spending it on? Bitcoin. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the last five pounds, what am I spending on? Jeez. Uh, I don't know. Um, Mario Kart, if I can get hold of it somewhere. Something fun like that. I don't know. Cool. Um, what's the one superpower you wouldn't want to have? I wouldn't want to have invulnerability. Interesting. Interesting. We're on Black Ticulate which is black action articulated. What's your favourite English word? Oh, that's a random question. Um, favourite English word? I'd, off the top of my head, I'd probably say something like onomatopoeic. That's it. That's what does that even mean? Oh, jeez, this guy. <laughs> uh, uh, no, because it's, it's, it's when a word sounds like it's... Like it's said. Like, yeah, like bang. Yeah. Or clap, that kind of thing. I, I like that word because it's an interesting one. Okay. And... Um, the second person that comes to mind when I say the word success. I don't know, Denzel Washington. Who's the first? <laughs> I was trying to cram like three people in there. I didn't know who to really pick. Right now, actually, in my head, Elon Musk. And the penultimate question before we do ask my listeners where they can find you on the World Wide Web and when they do what you'd like them to do, I want to ask you, how would you like to be remembered? Someone who cared. Um, someone who was willing to put other people before himself in the hope that they would do the same. Nice. And so, Martin, it's been a pleasure, but before we do let you go, how can we find you on the World Wide Web? Best to find me on my new website, which is www.vertex1.co.uk. That's one, the number one, not spelt. one. Can not you spelt spell O-N. it entirely, the Vertex? Yeah, v- V-E-R-T-E-X and the number one. Dot dot co.uk. Dot co.uk. That's, that's the easiest way to find me. Or email me at uh, vertex1clinic 
at gmail.com. And when we do email you or find you online, what would you like us to do? Anything specific? Uh, ask questions. Um, I suppose you can you can you can you can go onto my Instagram page again. It's the same thing, Vertex One. But ask questions or or leave reviews, reviews and, and things like that. But uh, that that kind of thing, I I don't really mind. I'm not really searching for anything in particular but just i guess to, to to get me out there to be as well known as i can be so i can reach as many people as i can amazing hey guys we really appreciate you listening and if you have any feedback whatsoever please do leave it in the comment section below also you can get all the information on the guests the links and resources we speak about in the description below there's plenty more videos in our archives and our video section, so do check that out. And last but not least, and this is really important, if you are somebody who can teach us how you do what it is you do, because Black Ticulate is all about empowering and upskilling the community, then please get in touch because we'd love to feature you too. Guys, you're the best. Hope you have a great day and see you soon.